it's good to see everybody this evening. Get out in the in the winter weather. Just kidding, it's not that bad outside. And it's a little bit chillier than it's been. But we're looking forward to, I think, not this coming week, but the next, well, I guess it is this coming week, not this week here. It's supposed to be in the 70s. I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to maybe wear, a pair, wear shorts one day in the week. Who knows? <clears throat> well, so... We're going to the book of Judges tonight, like I, like I promised. Uh, I think it'll be a, a wonderful journey as we go to do a verse-by-verse -verse study in the book of Judges. There's a lot to see there. There's a lot of uh, um, examples for, I think, every believer on, on the consequences of not doing what God asks. But we see uh, some good things this evening as we look at the first part of the book, at least. Um, hopefully everybody's afternoon went well. They got the rest that they needed as well, and... I don't have any other announcements since this morning, but um, I want to add Phil to the prayer list. He's not feeling that great tonight, so he stayed home. Cherith is still at home, and, and Gail's with, with her because this afternoon it was um, a little rough, had some rough patches, so um, it looks like she's got herself a stomach bug. Hopefully that's not what Phil has, but uh, we are in the season of that mess. So, But we'll pray for them this morning or this evening as well as we go to the Lord here in a few moments. Um, all right, well, I don't have anything else to say about that. Why don't we go ahead and sing our first song if we turn to page 32. Page 32, I sing the mighty power of God. Thank you so much that we have the opportunity to gather here uh, this evening to be around your word, Lord, as we fellowship around it. I pray that our hearts would be encouraged and challenged, Lord, that uh, things that need to change, that we would be pricked to the heart about those things and change and conform to the image of your Son, Lord. But also you give us encouragement from it as we may need that in our time of, of unrest in the world we live in. But above all things, we want your name to be glorified this evening, Lord. We also want to lift up <clears throat> several this evening to you in, in prayer. I think of Phil um, and Cherith both as they are feeling a little bit unwell. Lord, we pray that you would remove any um, discomfort from their bodies and let them heal up from whatever sicknesses may be bothering them or uh, plaguing them at this time, Lord, and give them comfort and peace and, and uh, encouragement as they are away from fellowship and, uh, and such. Lord, I also want to pray again for Mason Cooper as we are continue to bring him before the Lord. And I want, also want to add uh, uh, the request we haven't prayed too much for publicly, but uh, Sierra, as this young lady as well, who has gone undergone a great deal of um, surgeries to restore her body, uh, having have, having had amputated 
uh, all her limbs and so forth, that you would bring her back to full health and bring a great deal of encouragement to her life and her family's life as they approach this uh, the future and, and the difficulties and the differences that have come up because of these life changes. But give grace to them and strength in this time of, of uh, change. Lord, also, as I said, pray for Mason, that his body would heal up, that um, the, the cancer would have been completely removed and that he would be healed and restored completely. As he is several pages over, I like to make a big span in our hymn selection to page 849 this time, 849, uh, Be Thou My Vision. and take a tithe and offerings. I guess Melvin will have you come up and place a fill this evening. <clears throat> Giving praise and worship to God even through this time that we can uh, recognize His provision and His uh, sustenance of us, Lord, as we, give, as we give back to the Lord. Melvin, would you pray? Father, well, Lord, we have a real privilege to be in your house once again. We thank you for the opportunity we have to give back a small portion that you so richly blessed us with. We thank you for the way you supply the needs here in the church and our missionaries. And we ask you now to bless this offering. May it be used to glorify your name, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. We'll sing our last song together. 
You'll turn with me to page 185. 185, Jesus paid it all. We can stand together, together as we sing. Um, <clears throat> song as you think back on the Lord's washing of regeneration of your soul, washing you clean of your sins and bringing you into the body of Christ. <clears throat> we call that many things. I guess you're studying the doctrine of salvation or soteriology, but reconciliation comes to mind. Um, Holy Spirit baptism comes to mind. <clears throat> Wonderful things to talk about, think about, and celebrate as we Live our lives here on earth. <clears throat> All right, turn to the book of Judges. The book of Judges, chapter 1. Judges, chapter 1, this evening. Everybody get a handout? They, they want to fill out? I think we had enough. We should have had more than enough. I usually print a little bit more than needed. <clears throat> like I said this morning, as we go, as we look forward to going through the book of Judges. We're going to look verse by verse, as is pretty typical with me. I like to teach the Bible that way. Um, we have sections to talk about certain things. We, you see, it, I guess I can uh, in, get our minds up to speed on what the book of Judges looks like, what we should expect to go through. There's a pretty constant theme as you go through the book of Judges. You see, Israel starts off strong here, just to a degree, I guess you could say that. Starts off strong, and, um, and, and failure happens. That's kind of part, part of the cycle that they go through. But in order to start the cycle, you start with a judge. Israel gets a judge. The judge calls the, the nation back into uh, order, into serving the Lord, as opposed to serving themselves and false gods. Israel does that, then they get caught up in sin, sinful lifestyle of idolatry, and they go astray. And then God calls another judge, and then that cycle starts again. The judge gets them right, and they follow that for a while, and then they go back to the idolatrous ways. And it's back, and it's over and over. It's a vicious cycle that they go through. But you can see that very clearly as you go through this book. And of course, it always focus, it points to the, 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 
the need, the great need that man has for God to uh, save the soul and also to conform it into the image of his son if they're a believer and uh, to cause them to be maturing in, in um, their worship and uh, separation from the world. <clears throat> this evening, we're going to be considering the details that Samuel gave. Samuel is usually attributed as the, or it's usually attributed to Samuel to be the author of the book of Judges. Uh, Samuel, we talked about him a few a year or so ago, went through his life. But consider the details this evening that Samuel gave in this record. The facts that God delineates or shows and breaks down the details show the fact that he does that uh, shows us that he intends us to understand this is a factual account. There's a lot of information that we go through. I've, I've talked about that before, especially in our Sunday school lessons of late, looking at genres of scripture. Again, these aren't stories in the Bible that we have that we can try to draw some sort of moral principle off of. That's not what Scripture is. It's factual accounts that we can look at, like we would look at, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think, uh, the stats on a sports score when you're opening up the newspaper or looking online. You're expecting that to be kind of literal, word for word, understandable, literal. This is how this team won and this is how this team lost. Or... I should say the news, we're getting the facts of truth. That doesn't seem always to be the case, but um, there, there is an intended to understand literally what's being said. And that's the same case here in, in the genre that the book of Judges was written in. It's a historical narrative, factual historical account of the life of Israel as they go to take over the land that God had promised to them. So the fact that God delineates the details shows us that he intends us to understand this as a factual account. Uh, it's interesting. We don't depend on this, but um, occasionally we'll find, archaeologists will find uh, some sort of inscription somewhere or an account of something that happened in, in, a, in a time period in history. And, and you go and you say, hold on, that time period was right around the time period that these events occurred in the Bible. Um, and all of a sudden you see, well, there's not only similarities, but this stems to agree with one another. So you do look at what we call extra biblical information, not biblical, not from the Bible. And it will always point to the truth of the Bible. Now, there's a, there is, a, of course, an attempt for that not to happen. But there is a set of tablets, they're called the if I'll pronounce them right, the Armana tablets, which are an example of extra-biblical information. They were Egyptian diplomatic documents. And they showed that the king of Jerusalem was loyal to the nation of Israel, but they also recognize, it also recognizes that when Jerusalem, the area was supposed to be taken over, and we'll read that here this evening, by a certain tribe of Israel, the Benjamites, that they were not successful. And we can see in the, uh, the Armana tablets that it shows early on there as Benjamin was trying to, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit, to push out, the, to, to drive out the Jebusites. They did not. But instead, the king at that time in Jerusalem was consistently faithful to Egypt because the Benjamites had not done what God had asked. So, Historical record outside of Scripture validates what the Bible has to say. Of course, we don't need that. As a believer, we do come to the Word of God and, and just say, I'm going to believe it. It's going to be my final source of authority. And as I've said on multiple occasions, if anything disagrees with the Word of God, then I have to shed the idea that disagrees and cling to Scripture. It has to be my final authority if I'm a believer. So this evening we are going to see a common theme, as I said, another common theme, if you would, in the passage. It's kind of tied up into that vicious cycle of, of judge uh, and success and failure and so forth. This common theme I phrased as, now the Lord was with. I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that because the details of that can be added later. But now the Lord was with. God was with, Yahweh was with, ultimately his people. 
God is the source of Israel's promised land. He is the source of the strength to get this promised land as He has commanded them. And of course, why were they to go to this area and take this land over? Because God directed Abraham in his life to go and do that. God had promised, as we talked about a few Sunday evenings ago, to Abraham, gave him a covenant. You will have an everlasting land and you will be an everlasting people. So here this evening in the book of Judges, we are getting to that part where Israel and his 12 tribes were to go in and to conquer the land and to drive out those people who were in it. And the thing is, a lot of times that, for some reason in biblical sense, and maybe even historically, we get all up in arms about that. Well, how come they did that? Well, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, every nation that exists and has existed pretty much from time immemorial, except for when uh, Noah and the, and the sons were spreading them on the earth, there was always fighting and battling and conquering and taking lands. This is a pretty typical thing in history. So for us to read about it in a record here in, in uh, the Old Testament, we shouldn't be uh, taken aback thinking, wow, why did that happen that way? Because it has been consistently done. One, one group of people goes to a land and takes over and either drives out or assimilates the culture that's there already. It's just, unfortunately, it's the way the world works. So, these things in mind, let's get into the book of Judges, chapter 1. Our first point, we see, Judah was God's instrument. Judah was God's instrument. We see that in the first seven verses this evening. Judah was God's instrument. And when, when we come across these names like Judah and Benjamin, and we'll see Manasseh and Ephraim, which are actually the sons of Joseph, um, Asher and Aphtali, I could we could go on and name them all, but I won't. This is not the individual Judah, because there was a man named Judah and a, a Jacob's son named Simeon and Jacob's son named uh, Asher and so forth. This, at this point in history, these men are long dead. And now it's their, their tribe. So there are multiple groups of people. When it says uh, Judah was God's instrument here, it was that tribe of people. Maybe there were some dissenters who weren't going to be involved in this, but we can take it that it was, we'll say the whole group of people uh, here were going in and being God's instrument. We'll see that in verses 1 through 7, as I said. Now let's read. Now it came about after the death of Joshua that. The sons of Israel inquired of the Lord, saying, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? So, a few things that we can, we can kind of understand from this verse. Now it came about after the death of Joshua. We see Joshua is not involved. Uh, I would recommend that you go back and maybe uh, at some point during the re week Read through Joshua to some extent. There's a lot of information covered in Joshua that is uh, similar to the information here. Some of these things have occurred, and it's just repeating them in the book of Judges. But it's an interesting to see the parallels and, and uh, the separate accounts and so forth <clears throat> as you go along. But they say, Now it came about after the death of Joshua that the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord, saying, Who shall go up uh, first for us against the Canaanites? Uh, to fight against them. The strong leadership of Moses and Joshua had come to an end. Remember, if you would with me in your time of reading, maybe the, the Pentateuch, that here Moses was this man that led the nation of Israel, which was captive in Egypt, out of that nation and worked with them for decades, um, even in the wilderness and so forth. And then Joshua, his... Um, what's the word? I want to use the word protege, but that's not the right word. But the, the, the man that he chose that was going to lead after him um, uh, was established. God worked with uh, this man Joshua and said, all right, after I go, we're going, the people are going to need a leader. So they bring Joshua in. And now we're at a point here where Joshua has passed away and no man had been given the responsibility to lead the people. That's why we have the book of Judges, because God's going to transfer uh, the leadership of the country from the one man uh, in those scenarios in a long length of time to an individual that was set up to do certain things, these judges. 
But the strong leadership of Moses and Joshua had come to an end. The people had rallied around God, though, and or rallied around, really, God's leader for His people. And then it says, they inquired of the Lord. They asked Him, who's next? Who's going to go up first for us? So I think what you can see here is a group of people who had been told and seemed to be obedient to, depending on the Lord. I know, Lord, you, you give us a man to lead us as a group of people. Who's going to do that next? Where do we go? So they inquire of the Lord. That's, that's a good starting point. God, what do you want me to do? How should we do this? Do I need someone to direct me? So this is a good and appropriate next step for them. And then it goes on and says, Who shall go up first uh, uh, for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? To fight against them. Well, what can we understand from that? <clears throat> Israel knew that they needed to take this land. They were aware of the enemies that were there. You go back with me to uh, 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 the account where Joshua and Caleb amongst the 12 spies were the only two that came back with a report of, we can do this. Or the, what, what's the kid's song? Uh, Ten were bad and two were good. I think, I don't, lots of hand motions and all that kind of stuff I won't get us doing tonight for the kid's song. But <laughs> um, you, you, in that event of spying out the land, they saw there were enemies there. And of course, at that time, these enemies were big men, were, were massive giants, if you would. We'll touch on that this evening as well. <clears throat> but they knew we need to go in, <clears throat> but we need someone to lead us in the fight against this to drive out the people so that we can take this land as you told us to. Israel knew that they needed to be obedient. Like I said, I would encourage you to go back to Joshua, the book of Joshua, and read a little bit about that. Kind of add that extra information so that this really comes alive and pops out to you. Verse 2 goes on and says this, The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. God gave Israel, at this point, the paradigm for how he would accomplish his will for his people. He gave them the, the template, the paradigm. This is, you do these things, instructions, of, uh, in order to get the land that I have promised. Again, we know in the Abrahamic covenant, God said, I'm going to provide a land and it will be yours forever. And I will, I will make your people last forever. We, we, we talked about that being an unconditional covenant. And that is absolutely the truth there. But now we see aspects of uh, this being fulfilled and the people had to do something. It wasn't just God would just vaporize the people or cause them all to say, hey, you know what, we want to live over here now. Let's get on out of this place. But no, they were required. So they were being obedient in that sense <clears throat> to follow this paradigm that he had given. You have to clear the land out. You have to drive the people out. And then it also says, I have given the land into his hand. Again, Judah being this tribe. Joshua is going to be your leader. You've asked me who's going to lead. I've given you the instructions here. Not Joshua, Judah. Um, and the land has been given into his hand. That's enough information for Israel to say, okay, we got this. You know, it really doesn't make a difference what we're going to face. We've been told that this is our land and it's been given to him. Now we just got to go over there and, and get to it. <clears throat> so the Lord's promise is clear there. God wanted Israel to remember the unconditional nature of Abraham's covenant, but also their responsibility to be involved. God would take care of it. You just need to go. Verse 3. Then Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted me, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I, in turn, will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. There's a lot that we can see in here. Again, you have one obedient brother, Judah, going up with his, uh, speaking with his other brother, or the tribe, I should say this, one obedient tribe here, as they were to lead and going to the other tribe, the tribe of Simeon here. And he, he's, he encourages him, come up with me, I need help. I'm not going to be able to do this alone. And I want you to be involved in this with me. Come up with me into the territory allotted to me. This is what was given and promised to me. That we may obey God. That we may fight against the Canaanites here. 
And then he promises, or I'm saying he, but you realize I'm talking about the group here. Then they, then they promise that they will do the same for the tribe of Simeon. But can you see the leadership that's coming out here? The leadership that's, that he's obeying God, and in his obedience, or in their obedience, they're getting other people to be obedient to God as well. That's what leadership really does. It leads by example. It goes and does the work, not just delegates it all the time and says, you know, I'm going to have all, the, all y'all do all the hard work. Of course, delegation is a part of leadership. But no, we see the tribe of Judah get, his, uh, get the, the other tribe of Simeon here involved in this, leading in godliness. And with that example, um, they would take the land as God had promised because they know they were supposed to be obedient to that. A spiritual leader, as I said, will do the same. Invite others to serve God alongside with them. Whether that be in mentoring or whether that be two individuals that are equal in their spiritual maturity, just iron sharpening iron in that process. Spiritual leaders will come alongside others and build them up and help them and get them involved. Verse 4 goes on and says, When Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands, and they defeated 10,000 men at Bezek. 10,000 men. This is a great group of people at this location, Bezek. This was the work of God, we have to remember, and not the work of Judah and Simeon here. Because we see, he tells tells the group of people that I have given the land into the hand of, of Judah here. And in verse 4 it says, Judah went up and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands. I think Samuel was making it obvious that God was the one doing the work in all of this. In any work, in any spiritual endeavor, in any, any ministry that we have to be involved in, the Lord has to have the full reins to that. He is doing the work. We as Christians are empty vessels just doing what he asks us to do. We think about that in uh, the responsibilities we are given as the bride of Christ, as his church. We are evangelistic, but we don't win souls to the Lord. God does. We don't save a single soul. We just are that empty vessel to give the message. As you disciple someone, you are dependent. The discipler is dependent upon the word of God to teach and the Holy Spirit to convict and of course, the disciple he has to be de- dependent and surrendered to the Word of God for the correction or instruction that it gives. The Lord made the victory possible. I'm just going to touch on this for a moment. I actually don't have it in my notes, but I, I spent a great deal of time trying to get some background on the Canaanites specifically, because they're going into the land of Canaan. But there are several groups of people that will be there. The Canaanites, the Perizzites here, the Jebusites we'll read about this evening. Um, who were they? What exactly, uh, what, what were they like? There's not a great deal of information that defines the group of people. Um, but what we know from biblical history, they're, of course, they worshipped gods. They, they didn't worship Yahweh. And the worship of those gods was pretty wicked. And we've talked about that before, but uh, lots of uh, immoral practices that went on in their worship services, Uh, lots of death of of humans that went on, sacrifices, human sacrifice, child sacrifice, infant sacrifice in order to worship. Uh, And these were terrible, terrible things. God never commanded that to happen that way. And it is actually commanded that you do something about it when someone murders another person. <clears throat> and then again, the, the immorality that was involved as well um, was a, a terrible thing and it was an affront to God. So that's about all I'm going to tell you about the Canaanites at this moment. <laughs> and I'll keep studying and seeing if I can get a little bit more of a detailed explanation of who they are for another time. But they went up there into that land and they defeated 10,000 men at Bezek. They smote 10,000 men at Bezek. Verses 5 and 6 go on and they say, kind of giving a detailed account of what went on. They found Adonai Bezek in Bezek and fought against him and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Verse 6, But Adonai Bezek fled 
And they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. It's a pretty gruesome thing to think about. I mean, uh, pretty, I imagine, very painful. <laughs> but a pretty gruesome thing that came about. But this man, their leader, Adonai Bezek, that word Adonai, we actually call God Adonai. That's one of his names. But really, it can be used to just be called to, to, for the word Lord. Um, so it was basically saying the Lord of Bezek. The Lord of this area, the, the king of Bezek, if you would. So they fought against him and the group of people there. He breaks loose and runs and they track him down. And they cut off his, the, the Hebrew says, the thumbs of his hands and the thumbs of his toes. Um, I don't know how often you call your, your big toes thumbs or your great toes thumbs, but uh, there it is. <clears throat> so they did these things. Verse 7 kind of gives a little bit of information to us on why exactly they did that thing in particular. Were they just seeking vengeance and wanted to torture the man? I don't think that was the case at all. We see what verse 7 says, Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off, used to gather up scraps under my table, as I have done, so God has repaid me. So they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. So, what we understand is this man, Adonai Bezek, at least cut off the, the thumbs of their hands and toes of 70 kings to humiliate them. They, this, you see there, to eat the scraps under his table. Uh, that's not an uncommon thing in, in, in at least ancient war, warfare. If you can get the king in a position like that, you cut off the head of the snake and you kill the body, and, but you humiliate the king... And now you look really, you look like a big shot. You've, you've accomplished it. You've got 70 kings who you don't even let sit at your table. You don't even have to show them respect. They eat the scraps from your table. And you've humiliated them. Now they can't function as a human in an easy way anymore. They can't hold a sword. They can't do much of anything without thumbs. And um, I would imagine they had a hard time walking in a good balance without their big toes. That, that big toe that does a pretty good job at keeping you balanced. But he also recognized that this happened to him because he did what he did. As he says here, as I have done, so God has repaid me. He received maybe a just penalty. At this time as well, the, the, the justice system of that time was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So maybe it was a, a toe for a toe and a thumb for a thumb in this situation as well. But we see that God brought justice swiftly upon him. He remained in Jerusalem but died there as well. Adonai Bezek's punishment caused him to recall the torturous behavior that he committed to those around him. And God allowed this man to have a taste of his own medicine to see what it was, to, what, see what it was like to be conquered by him. This is what kings feared, humiliation. And now he was humiliated. The nature, as I said, of this man's attacks and what happened to this man are not being justified. But, it's, but it does definitely show that the Lord can bring swift justice. But it also shows us that power creates greed. I've quoted it recently, but power corrupts, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I think that was the case for this man, Adonai Bezek. He was absolutely corrupted. Next, the giants. The giants. The Jebusites and Anak's sons. Starting in verse 8. <clears throat> then the sons of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. Verse 8. Well, let me stop there for a moment. So here, it's interesting, as we, as we keep moving along, we'll see some difficulty that was actually had. Uh, as you read through these passages, you'll, you'll find information in, like, uh, in previous verses, and then all of a sudden you'll find a little bit more detail, detail about what happened um, during, we'll say, verse 8 here. I can't, at the moment, I, didn't, I should have wrote this down better. But uh, later on we'll find out there's difficulty capturing Jerusalem. But I think what we have in verse 8 is 
after the fact, after the difficulty happened and the city was actually captured to some degree, or, or at least people went in. And again, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but in this capturing here, um, it wasn't a complete success. The Jebusites, as we learn here in a few moments, remained on in the city. And ultimately, if, if my timeline is correct, David was the one that actually had the success in capturing Jerusalem and driving out everyone who did not get driven out before. And you see that in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. And when David gets in there, you know what he does? He gets in there, captures the city, and he says, I'm going to call this my city. And it's known as the city of David. And of course, David was a man who was, who was a mighty man of war, and he, uh, he was going to accomplish God's will because he loved his Lord, and he was going to do whatever was possible to get this city. But here, we see the sons of Judah fighting against Jerusalem, catch, capturing some part of it to, to a degree, or at least the city itself. And of course, struggle with the edge of the sword, so he's fighting the people and setting the city on fire. The capital of Jerusalem um, would be won, but it would, it would be through a lot of suffering, great amount of suffering. Verses 9 and 10 uh, go on to say, After the sons of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites, living in the hill country, and in the Negev, and in the lowland. Verse 10, So Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of the Hebron for, now the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriath Arba, and they struck Shishai and Amen and Talmai. So they struck some individuals here. And ultimately we're seeing God again accomplish his plan, God's accomplishing his will as they continue to move along. I don't I it was I debated the way I was going to put a map up so we could see these places, but if you were to bring a map up and see the land or the territory of Judah, he's going all over the place in that area, that territory. They're not necessarily one city after the other, but he's going up here and fighting here, and then he's going to come down to the, uh, to the plains and fight there. Um, depending on your translation, as it says in verse 9, that... Uh, I'll start from the beginning. After the sons of Judah went down to fight against, so they're going south, to fight against the Canaanites living in the hill country and in the Negev. The Negev is just the southern regions. That's uh, what the Negev is. It's called that even, I think, to this day. But the Negev and then the lowlands. So they're proceeding to, to conquer uh, by force and with Simeon with them there, <clears throat> or the tribe of Simeon, obeying God's plan, this is your land, this is your inheritance, come take the land. So all that comes about. Again, verse 10 goes on to say, So Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron, there in that place. Kiriath Arba was its former name. And they struck these three individuals, Shishai and Ahiman and Talmai. I think I pronounced it a little bit better that time. Um, they struck these three individuals down. Now, I'm going to wait a few moments before I tell you who they were. Because it's, it, if you read that, and it's the, it's the case most of the time when you read the Old Testament, uh, here Samuel assumes a lot of his readers, that he knows things. It's been a while, but I've talked about when you interpret things like this. It's called a presupposition pool. It's, it's, it's a pool of knowledge. And when that pool is great, the writer here, Samuel, assumes that you knew who Shishai, Ahaman, and Talmai were. But of course, if you were like me, I have no idea who these guys were. But it gets defined later on. He, he goes on and, and, shrinks, and shrinks that pool up and says, all right, let me, let me allude to who, to who these men were. But they are a, it's a major thing of what happened here. But I'll leave it at that because I don't want to, like I said, jump ahead of myself, which I've been doing for a while. Um, so some, some applications to this point. Number one, God gave the land into Judah's hand. We see this was a work that God had commanded them to do, and God was at the forefront. He was doing what he had uh, uh, command. He is doing what he had promised he would do: give them a land. But he was expecting them to work, and God gave the land to the Judas, into Judah's hand. Next, God was not worried about these giants. Kind of giving it away at this point. Shishai and Ahiman and Talmai 
were giants. Uh, not the baseball team or the football team. I'm terrible with sports. Is there a, there's not a Giants baseball team, is there? <laughs> they were massive individuals. Uh, again, recalling Caleb and Joshua's experience spying out the land in, in, in a great bow that had to be carried on stays between two individuals because the grapes were so big. These were the people of that land. Massive. Historically, in, in the Bible, we know one individual was probably 13 feet tall, King Og. And Goliath was given the, the height of about 9 feet or a little over 9 feet tall. That, that's not a typical size. And I'm sure he was properly proportioned. He wasn't stretched out. He was a massive, muscular individual, a terror to meet on the battlefield. But yet... They went against them and took the land from these giants. So God was not worried about these giants. Judah must trust God's power. He didn't necessarily say, All right, guys, I want to see what's going to happen. You're going to go down there. There's some big men. Are you going to be able to get this? You know, uh, I hope you can do it. God said, I have given the land into your hand. So when you come across these giants, remember, I have given the land into your hand. This is your land. It implies success. There's a lot of things. You can, you can allegorize giants here. There's a lot of difficult things that we face in our life. But when we're trying to honor God with our lives, trying to do what He's asked us, asked us to do, He has given us the victory in those things. When He gives you a command to go uh, grow in Christ, then we have that ability, even when we fight against the giant of our own flesh. We can be successful and become more like our Lord. That's just one, one thought. Verses 11 through 15. Caleb seeks his portion. This is where, at least in my time, in my interest, things get very uh, interesting to, to dig into. We'll sit down here for a few moments. Verses 11 through 15, we see Caleb seeks his portion. Then from there he went against the inhabitants of Debir. Now, the name of Debir formerly was Kiriath Sefer. It's interesting, Kiriath Sefer. The word Kiriath means town, and Sefer means like scroll or book. So, I don't know, maybe there was a great library here. Maybe this was a land of intelligence. Who knows? Maybe there was another reason that they called it scroll. Maybe there was a mountain that looked like a scroll. I'm just giving you a whole bunch of what ifs, maybes. I can't answer it. But it was before uh, Kiriath Sefer and then now, at this time, it's Debir. Verse 12 goes on. And Caleb said, The one who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will even give him, uh, give him my daughter, Aksa, for a wife. So here's a promise. Well, first, let me mention this. Maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't. Did you, did you realize, I'll ask it as a question, that Caleb was not a Jew? Caleb was a Gentile? He was from the, 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 ultimately he was from Esau. He was one of Esau's, if I want to say his, it was either his sons or grandson, Kenaz was the name. Caleb was a Kenazite. And yet here is this Gentile man who's attached himself to the Jewish people and has a part of the promised land. That's, that's an amazing thing that God was using this individual and in, in giving them a land uh, amongst the Israelite, the promise to the Jewish nation. But like I said, Caleb was faithful. When the ten were bad, Caleb and Joshua, Joshua were the good spies. They said, we can take this land. We don't have to worry about the giants there. We've got this because God is with us and He has given us the land. And here we see Caleb gain the land that he had, he had wanted. And he goes against the giants at that time and gets it. So again, Caleb says, the one who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will, give, I, will, I will even give him my daughter, Aksa, for a wife. So, as I said, there were Gentiles in the Old Testament that God used and that they, these Gentiles worshipped the Lord. We also see that in Ruth as well. Caleb was a faithful man of God. We see in Caleb the focus of a person that will obey God and not worry about the world's power and problems that resist us. 
and that threaten us. I am in this with the Lord and I will do what He says regardless of what comes about. But I don't think it was a we may win, we may lose situation in the mind of this man. This was, I'm getting my land and it's going to be mine and that's all there is to it. Why? Because God has promised us that to be the case. And if God's promised, then He's the one that's going to fight the battle anyway. He's the one that's gaining the victory. It's interesting too, as you see here, something that in our day and age we would say, uh, maybe we wouldn't do it this way. <laughs> but Caleb makes this promise. Whoever captures uh, this land, I will even give him my daughter, uh, Aksa, for a wife. Now, just as we're going through this, looking at Caleb and Caleb's daughter, and then the man that conquers the land, what I want to point out to you that you don't see it directly in the text, but it's there. It's like that presupposition pool. It was understood by the readers, but we have to dig a little bit deeper to get it out. But what we can see is a man, Caleb, providing for his family like he should. Bringing, protecting his family, providing for his family. So he offers his daughter as, as, a, as a chick for a wife. And of course, uh, Aksa didn't seem to mind this. She wasn't rebelling about it or complaining about it. So it was probably culturally acceptable uh, in that time as well. So Caleb sets the standard. Who's going to get my daughter? A man who is obedient to God's command because they're going to go in there and drive out the people of Debir. And then that man's going to be capable enough to do that very thing. Not falter and fail when he's gone in, but he's going to stand strong. And he's going to go in. This man is going to prove himself of godly character if you're going to go in and do this. Caleb um, had expectations. So what was going to happen? Verse 13 goes on and says, Othniel the son of Kenaz, um, Caleb's younger brother, there's the lineage there, captured it, so he gave him his daughter Aksa for a wife. So Othniel shows himself to be worthy of this, of this wonderful prize. Imagine having Caleb as a grandfather, the man who kills the giants. Again, the man who has no problem with the giants. So uh, the, the marriage obviously ensues. You'll find as well, and like I said, if you read parallel in the book of Joshua, Othniel is the first judge in this uh, uh, period of judges. He's the first judge that Israel would have in order to judge right from wrong and to lead the people back into the, to a worship of the Lord and so forth. And like I said, sometimes judges fail, sometimes they didn't. Sometimes the people rebelled against God's chosen judge as well. <clears throat> so Othniel will be Israel's first judge. Othniel was providing, or excuse me, Caleb was providing a worthy man for his daughter. <clears throat> Here, verse 14 and 15. And then it came about when she came to him that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. Then she alighted from the her donkey and Caleb said to her, What do you want? Verse 15. She said to him, Give me a blessing since you have given me the land of the Negev. Give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. As we continue to look at this account here of Caleb providing for his family and, and drawing out, if you would, a man that would be worthy of his daughter. Now we have this interaction uh, between his daughter and him. Um, Let's see what I want to, what I, where I want to start at. <laughs> Let me just start at ver, first the verse in verse 14. Then it came about when she came to him, she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. Then she, as it says here, then she alighted from her donkey and Caleb said to her, what do you want? So again, as we trace maybe the theme of a godly relationship between a parent and a child, but specifically here, a father and a daughter, Caleb had proven that he was a a, a respectable man who cared for his family here. And here um, Aksa comes up to him and approaches him Then she, as it says, she alights from her donkey. Really what that word alight means is not that she just hops down and walks over to talk to him. She actually gets down and bows down to him. And what you have here is you have the proper relationship of the daughter showing respect and reverence to a father but the father had earned that. And it was a uh, amicable relationship, a, a loving relationship. 
in, the, in these two in their interaction here. Caleb had provided in his, his um, not only a husband to a degree, but given them the Negev, the southern area, the, the wildernessy area in that place. And then she is reverent to her father there as she alights or gets down and bows down and then asks her Lord, uh, Father, would you provide even more? Even though you've done this, I want you to give me a blessing. Give me springs. Well, why did she ask for the springs? Well, because it was kind of arid. And, and, and Caleb said, all right, upper springs and lower springs. So yet again, we see provision from Caleb. Not only am I going to give you a place to live, but it's going to be fruitful because I'll give you the springs to water it so that uh, the land will produce as it should. And he gives, he gives unrestrainedly. Caleb was also an older man at that time. It wouldn't have been any benefit for him to say, no, you have to come up to my house every, every uh, day to get you some pails of water from my, my springs. <clears throat> Another thing as we travel through the book together, I try to point out as many themes that we can. Sometimes I focus on one thing. But another theme that we will see through here, as I said, we start off strong. we got individuals who are following God and doing what they want, uh, doing what He wants. And then gradually the nation of Israel just is doing their own thing most of the time. Their, their judges fail at times. Some of them pass. <clears throat> but what we see is this woman who is um, uh, faithful and respectable to her father. She's probably a very godly woman and honoring God, but also having confidence as she approaches her father and asks for a blessing and so forth. And then we kind of see that in Deborah when we get into the, 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 the Deborah and Jael as they are acting as judges. But we have this woman who goes and takes charge where the man does not and, and um, enacts God's justice upon a wicked man. But then when we end the book, we learn about a, a Levite woman who is, who is, as an understatement, treated poor, poorly, and she's uh, murdered. And, and, and you see this gradual progression of, of the good slowly decaying and coming down to bad things happening. And we see that theme through the book as well. Verses 16 through 20, point D, Now the Lord was with Judah. Now the Lord was with Judah. His hand was with him. He had given the land to the tribe of Judah. He had given Judah as a leader to go in first and fight. Verse 16 says, The descendants of the Kenite, Moses, his father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms with the sons of Judah to the wilderness of Judah, which is in the south of Arad. And they went and lived with the people. The Kenites were also not Jewish. They were possibly from Canaan. But as it says here, who were the Kenites? Why are they important? Because they were a part of Moses' family. Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, uh, was a Kenite. And it's, like I said, possible that they were in the land of Canaan, but then they left and followed uh, uh, Moses in the wilderness because they knew Moses and because he was a man that was following God. <clears throat> but ultimately, those who honor God and follow His ways for His people receive a blessing as well. Those who honor God here in this Old Testament passage and follow Israel because they were the representation of God, they were the God's people, they received blessing. And that is the case for us as well. If we honor God and follow His ways, we are blessed. But even drawing that into the, the secular realm, I'll, I'll use this one example because I'm Time is fleeting. <laughs> um, our country, as it was founded, uh, a, a lot of the system of law that we have is, is reminiscent to the Ten Commandments. Actually, we see it posted up or put up uh, in courthouses uh, in the country. But here is a secular aspect. Not, I mean, as a country, we're not God's people, but yet the unsaved and the saved alike say, hey, this is a good thing to follow. And when the laws are followed, do not murder, do not lie, do not bear false testimony, and so forth. There's benefit and blessing in that. As we see it happened here to the Kenites. Verse 17, moving quickly. Then Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they struck the Canaanites living in Zeph uh, Zephath and utterly destroyed it. So the name of the city was called Hormah. 
Horma, ultimately, if you were to maybe write this down in your notes, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 45, we have a, an account there of, of Horma. And it was a place of defeat in Israel's past, where they had chosen to follow themselves instead of God's direction, and they were defeated miserably there. It was a very embarrassing, humiliating situation. But now as Judah is following God and doing what he asks him to do, they go in and they take the city. And that reproach upon the nation of Israel had been removed because they had defeated uh, Hormah. God was going to show his strength through Israel, even though they had went astray earlier and lost. Verse 18, And, and Judah took Gaza, with its territory, and Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. Here Judah continues to follow the Lord and continues to conquer because God had given the land in his hands, not because of their own strength. Verses 19 and 20. <clears throat> now the Lord was with Judah, and they took possession of the hill country, and they could not drive out the, the inhabitants of the... Uh, they could not drive out of the inhabitants because they had iron chariots. So difficulty sets in. And maybe a, a little bit of discouragement. Verse 20. Then they gave uh, Hebron to Caleb as Moses had command, or promised and he drove out from there the three sons of Anak. So there's your parallel passage. Verse 10 says he drives out uh, the sons there. Or that drives out those three men and now we realize these were the sons of Anak. And Anak was a giant. There's, the, there's how I know he was. they were giants. Uh, sometimes giants are referred to as the Anakim, which means it's plural for Anak. So we see uh, there's difficulty that sets in in verse 19, and then finally verse 20 shows again the victory there, that they went in and took the land that, uh, that had been promised them. And the question was, were the people going to trust God's faithfulness? Were they going to be obedient even though their circumstances looked difficult? We can see that God does not allow things to be easy all the time for us believers, but he's still we are still responsible to obey. We are still responsible to look to the Lord and not through our own fallen eyes. If God's told us to do something, we can assume that He's going to carry us through it and allow us to be able to do it, strengthen us and empower us to do it. <clears throat> and finally, verse 21. Let me close with this. Altering the purpose of the Lord. Altering the purpose of the Lord. Here we see failure. The first real record of it. Verse 21 says, But the sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day, to the day of the recording of the book. Here we have a foreshadowing of what the rest of the book will look like. But the sons of Benjamin did not drive out, did not obey, would suffer the consequences of that disobedience. As I said, he doesn't make it easy, but he does empower you to get through it. The Christian life is not easy to walk but He gives us the strength to do it and the grace to do it. And forgiveness when we fail and we need to get back up again and keep moving. So as we are closing with this verse today, as I said, it sets the theme for the rest of the book of failure. We see this monstrous conjunction, but. Everything is going well, but the failure set in. They had abandoned God's power and rested on their own. They abandoned God's plan and tried to do their own thing. We'll let them stay here with us. We'll do something like that. We'll see many of the other tribes will do the same thing. We'll enslave them. They'll just be our slaves. Maybe it's a better idea instead of driving them out to just make them our slaves. That didn't, does not ever work well. Do not for one minute think that the enemy is willing to give you any ground. You have to fight for it. Of course, our enemy is Satan in our own flesh at times. But they will not give ground. You have to keep moving and fight for it. And at times we have to fight tooth and nail to bring glory to God. We cannot be like the Benjamins. We cannot be content to live with the world and the enemy in our midst and just hoping they won't overpower us. 
So as you live as the light of the world, here's a few things to consider and to practice. First, do not be content to make compromise. The Benjamites were content. This is too difficult. We'll let them live with us. Don't ever have that perspective on living the Christian life. Next, know that the Lord is always with you. Benjamin had forgotten that. The tribe of Benjamin had decided not to believe that to be the case. So they compromised with allowing the Jebusites to stay. And next, and finally, take on the giants of this life, like Caleb. Look at him and say, this is a huge problem and I have a, I am absolutely incapable of taking, of it, taking care of it. But guess what? God is with me. And He will give the victory. Know that God is with you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank You so much for the time You've given us this evening and the opportunity to read just again of Your great power and Your abilities to take care of us and to fulfill Your promises. As we go out this evening, keep us safe as we travel to and fro and make our, our, our appointments and our, our visits. Lord, let us glorify you in our lives as we go about, as we interact with the world around us. Lord, let us trust in you to give us the victories in the difficult circumstances of our lives. And Lord, convict us and burden us not to compromise to the world and to the enemy, the devil, that runs and always fights against us. Let us be strong in you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing the first verse of page 74, Singing I Go. Hopefully this can kind of be a theme for your week. Page 74, if you'll stand, we'll sing verse number one of Singing I Go. <laughs> that as a believer today that the Lord has given you strength he's lifted the load and the burden so trust in him and glorify him today dad would you close us in a word of prayer Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship you